All right, so hopefully you've had a chance to go watch that video. And it was Stanley Kubrick, by the way, that directed the film. I do apologize for that. That movie's going to come up a couple of times this semester as we look at this. But again, this was a scene where only lit by a couple of candles, a few candles. Um, and the, it was kind of interesting, I think, that video because it wasn't just me talking about it. You got to watch. But I don't want to play the video. Sorry, wrong click uh, to do that. So let's get into three-point lighting. So when you use artificial light, they usually start with the face. They, the face of the figure is what we're really trying to look at. Light isn't just thrown into a flat face. Um, and there are three lights, the key light, the fill light, and the back light that all go into this. And this is a little bit beyond my expertise here. Um, I've seen photographers do this, and photographers will have lights all over the place. They'll like, move it this way and move it that way. And it's like, how did you tell there was a difference? But whatever. Uh, but the key light provides the brightest illumination. The fill light is areas that could be too dark. Just kind of, it fills things in, like it says. And the backlight's used for several things, including illuminating the background. It can also shine light atop the actors. So the key light aims directly at the subject in the front. Looks straight at the actor. So this is the actor. The actor is facing down in this picture. Key light fills here. The B is the fill light. The fill light is filling in. It's trying to fill in some others. You may have a second fill light if needed. And then the backlight, in this case, it's shown actually shining behind the subject, helps separate the subject from the background. I'm not sure if the backlight has to always shine like that or if um, the... Sh Sorry, I'm putting my phone back on Do Not Disturb because it's come off the timer. Uh, the fill light is facing towards... The backlight's facing up towards the front in this case. So it enhances the depth of the shot. So... Here's an example of where you can kind of see some of this aspect uh, from the Scarlet Empress, 1986. You can see the shadow and you can see um, the face. I think with black and white, you probably wanted some shadow uh, to really help illuminate the thing. Otherwise, it's just white pretty much, you know, so some shadow works as well. Uh, here's a scene from Stand By Me in 1934 where you can kind of sort of see the, the, the lighting of the characters. You can, you can make out all the details of their faces. Um, though in you know real life, you probably would see some shadow and things like that. But we have all this going on here. Uh, quality of light is important as well. It refers to whether the light on the subject is hard or soft. Hard light will shine directly on the subject, creates very crisp details, a defined border. Whereas soft light is diffused, it's spread out. Um, it hits the subject from many slightly varying directions. It blurs the line between illumination and shadow and decreases contrast as a result of that. So here we see from the Titanic uh, 1997, you can still see a little bit of shadow on his face, but we see the definition as well. Outdoor shots and direct sunlight pose a big risk of casting harsh shadows. Um, this shows the effect of the, of the reflector board and what the reflector board does to help soften the shadows. And they cast diffuse light on the bottom of his chin as well. You can see that too. Um, so it gives his face a softer, warmer look on screen, not a very harsh, shadowy face. Uh, this kind of shows soft versus hard lighting in Citizen Kane. And Citizen Kane is referenced a lot throughout the semester because it had a lot of cinematogra cinematographic innovations. I'm not saying that word exactly right, but it was a lot of innovations in cinematography. So you can see um, you can see Charles Foster Kane, played by Orson Welles on the left, Susan Alexander, played by Dorothy Cummingore, on the right. And you can tell the lighting is slightly different between them. Um, he is 45 years old. She is 22. He is experienced and harsh. She is young and open, you know. So you can see a, a little bit of, it's a very subtle, in my opinion, amount of lighting without seeing it directly like this but you can tell that there is a difference in the lighting for these two characters um, that plays a big role here as we move forward. Okay, My mouse is on the wrong spot, sorry about that. Uh, night shooting as well, if possible at night, photographers like to go with natural lights such as light at storefronts, electric signs, street lights, etc., etc. Here's a scene from Jack Reacher 2012 starring Tom Cruise. You can see the street lights and you can even see the reflections in the water. You, you kind of get the, you get the feeling that you're there, really. Um, I know what you did last summer, 1997. You know, here's a scene. These are natural looking shots, but the lights were used off camera 
um, left. Um, you know it's supposed to be a night shot because of the darkness at the top of the frame, um, the flashlight and the car light. But um, this is probably not just natural lighting. You know, um, that moon is very, very bright out on this night as well. So um, day for night is um, a small interesting idea so you start getting into more artistic parts of film this is when shooting occurs during the daytime but the image is darkened in order to simulate night uh, the following clip was made night like by over under exposure uh, despite being filmed in broad daylight so what you might think you may look at that and say that's the moon it's actually the sun so they underexpose the film in order to um, show make it look like it was night um, again here's underexposure from fight club in 1999 to do that okay um we're gonna have one little video one more video clip here before i get into this last section i'll be right back <laughs> 